Dr. Weber, how close are we? <laughs> Yeah, 31 seconds. 31 seconds. Take your seats. 31 seconds to go, according to the atomic clock. Well, we'll go ahead and start because I've got a couple introductions to make anyway. Good morning. Welcome to the monthly meeting of the Omaha Public Power District Board of Directors. Uh, special visitors with us today are my oldest daughter, Jennifer, and two of her children, Rachel and Samantha. Would you please stand up, Samantha? Wave everybody. <laughs> To see their grandpa in action, so uh, we'll see how we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah, she knows how to pray, wave. They all learn that. Um, uh, Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Yes. Kavanaugh. Yes. Gay. Yes. Green. Yes. McGuire. Yes. Mines. Yes. Ulrich. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Item number two: announcement regarding public <clears throat> notice of meeting. Notice of the time and place of this meeting was publicized by notifying the area news media, by publicizing the same in the Omaha World Herald and outlets, by displaying such notice on the arcade level of Energy Plaza since January 10, 2014, and by mailing such notice to each of the district's directors on that same date. A copy of the proposed agenda for this meeting has been maintained on a current basis <coughs> and is readily available for public inspection in the office of the district's corporate secretary. Additionally, a copy of the Open Meetings Law is available for inspection in the public meeting book located in this meeting room. Item number three, approval of the November 2013 Comprehensive Financial and Operating Reports and of the minutes for the last meeting. So moved. Second. Call roll, please. Barrett. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Ulrich? Yes. Weber? Yes. Motion carried. Item number four, persons wishing to address the Board of Directors on a particular item are asked to approach the microphone as that agenda item is discussed. Comments will be heard following Board discussion of the item and prior to a vote by the Board. Persons wishing to address the Board on all other matters will have an opportunity before the close of the meeting. Item number five, resolution number 5983. <coughs> Now therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power District that management is hereby authorized to use the proposed earnings rates shown on the attached Exhibit A for the 2014 Fort Calhoun Station decommissioning funding analysis. Do I have a motion? Uh, so moved. Second. Second. I understand, Director Mines, you're going to cover this. I am, item. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the... Uh, Regarding the exhibit, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission requires the district to maintain an external fund uh, for the future de decommissioning of Fort Calhoun. The uh, district has been funding this trust since 1983 based on NRC defined cost formula. Uh, the district up updates the funding analysis annually using forecasted rates from IH. S, Global Insight, they're a leading provider of global market and economic information for decommissioning costs, inflation, and fund earnings. The IHS earnings rates are based on a five-year treasury note and adjusted for uh, <coughs> to reflect the higher yield of the district's actual decommissioning fund investments as it compared to the five-year treasury notes. The difference between the de decommissioning fund earning rates and decommissioning cost inflation rates, it's called real rate of return. Uh, used in 2014 decommissioning funding analysis was greater than 2% in most years. The NRC regulations require that OPPD to be of OPPD to maintain, obtain board approval when the real rate of return is greater than 2%. Previously, when the real rate of return was greater than 2%, the proposed decommissioning funds earnings rates were included within the Corporate Operating Plan, or COP, and approved as part of that COP. The NRC has questioned the earning rates used by the district within the past two years, prompting a review of pertinent NRC regulations. Upon completing this review, it was decided that a separate authorization of earnings rates would be more appropriate than simply including them in the COP. Resolution 5983 affirms that the district may use the earning rates shown in Exhibit A for the 2014 Fort Calhoun Station Decommissioning <coughs> Fund Analysis. 
And that's my report, Mr. Chairman. Sounds very good. Any questions from board members? Director Wright? <coughs> no, not so much a question, but uh, just when we discuss that in the Finance Committee, I think it's good that we are separating these and we got a good informative update of how, how that all works. I thought it was very, very good. So Edward did a good job informing us. And I think what we discussed earlier, so we'll get updates once a year or twice a year on where we're at because some of these inflation rates and everything changes, you know. But this would be kind of um, updates like we do with pensions or anything else. So we'll have that on the radar and then report back. This will be an annual process. An annual process. It's good because it's a lot more transparent. Yeah, I, I like separating it out. Where was it before? Um, it was a, it was an item that was proposed <coughs> in our corporate operating plan right. for annual budget and assumptions. So it was well, I, I think it's very good. We're looking at it separately and the amounts of money that are involved. So right. appreciate you doing that. And just for the record, the, the decommissioning fund for this year is going to be what? How much are we, does the district, how much is it paying this year? We actually have two funds. Yeah. We have an NRC minimum required fund that is in response to this analysis that you have in front of you. And then we have a separate fund that we fund over and above that amount to make sure that we not only can decommission the, uh, the nuclear portion of the plant, but can take the entire site to a greenfield status. So in 2014, we're projected to deposit our fund $3.4 million into that um, account. Into the, sec the, the account you just, the last one as far as the one? The second account. The NRC minimum account is actually overfunded today. When I say overfunded, what I mean by that is if you look at the amount we need to have and compare it to the amount we have on hand and you project this future earnings rate, we will have in 2033 more funds in that account than we need. Good. So those funds would then be available to assist on the other portion of the decommissioning, which would be the Greenfield site. Okay. Great, thank you. Edward, I, I also find it interesting that we're required to report when our earnings exceed 2% as opposed to are lower than 2%. It just flies in the face of being weird. Well, it, it, it is counterintuitive, but if your earnings rate is below 2%, then that would require you to put more money into the fund. And I think the concern is, is to make sure that we are adequately funding it so if you if your earnings rate is too high, then you may not be contributing enough. I see. I see. Okay. My, okay. My question is: this okay. is uh, we have calculations out here to 2067. Now, is that the 2034 is the end of the license? What do we have? Three another 34 years to uh, complete decommissioning? Well, well, technically, uh, by regulation, you have 60 years. So at 2033, you have 60 years to fully decommission the, f the facility. Our projections don't go that far. We, we do it much sooner. So we'll go into a safe store. Then we do the, um, the, the fuel transfer, and we transfer fuel once the DOE is projected to be able to receive it. And then we, we perform the decommissioning and then of the, the nuclear portion of the plant and then the greenfield portion. And so that's about a 30-year process in total. But by regulation, it could be up to 60. Yeah, because I was going to say at 2067, Chairman Ulrich will be the only one who's still on the board. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Edward. <laughs> Edward, one more question. Yes. So, but then we're limited on what we can invest in, right? Treasuries and... We, we are. So we, we're limited in, in high-grade securities, uh, treasuries. We have some corporate, corporate bonds. Yeah. So uh, government agencies. We manage that in-house. We don't put that out like we do the retirement fund. We, we, are, we are looking at some funds. Some yeah. funds. Okay. Thank you. Well, yeah, I'd like to echo uh, Director Gay's comments of this. Additional transparency, I think, is really good. And I'm sure it's part of the NRC's effort to make sure that these <laughs> funds are adequate to do the job. And, and that's all good for the public uh, to know and have this transparency. <clears throat> so I would agree with that. And the directors also do get a year, it's yearly audit, and the directors do get that report too. Any other comments to board members? Any from the public?
John Pollock, 1412 North 35th Street, Omaha. Uh, I'm glad you're uh, separating this out so that it's uh, more visible, and I fully agree with the board comments on that. Uh, I'm wondering, is that uh, uh, greater than 2% real rate of return, does that apply to the last few years, or is that taken over the, uh, the whole lifetime going back to the 1980s? Go ahead, Edward. I don't have a specific answer. I, I mean, I can't technically tell you for sure, but I'm, I'm pretty confident if you look back through the 80s, the real rate of return has been in that range. And more recently, it hasn't been that great. But as interest rates rise and inflation rises, and it's expected to go back to the more of the historical differential, which would be in that range. If you look short term and in, in the handout, you'll see that the differential is smaller. But once you go out four or five years, then it grows back to that. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about that because our uh, current financial environment is uh, rather different than it has been for quite a few decades at any rate. And it's uh, tough to get a real rate of return the way it was uh, many years ago. In fact, I was just looking at my savings bonds and uh, being glad that I bought those things at 4% back 15 years ago. It looked very boring at the time, but it's, it's great now. So I encourage you to be cautious about uh, uh, and keep track of that 2% real rate of return. You might not make it. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's why I was asking about the treasuries because they're usually linked to inflation. So I assume we'd be right in that range. It's, and that's why they do this every year. Yeah. yeah. Like in that's 14 why we're, and 15. The transparency of doing it every year will make it uh, very clear if, if it is or is not making those goals. Thank you. And we would have to fund it more yeah. if it's not. That's the big thing. We will have to put more money into the decommissioning fund if it is less than that. Yeah, that was my concern. Thank you. Anybody else? Seeing none, please call the roll, please. Barrett? Yes. Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Ulrich? Yes. Weber? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Motion carried. Item number six, resolution number 5984. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power District that the proposal of Irwin Industries, Inc., in the amount of $1,333,536 to provide labor for the removal and replacement of sections of water wall tubing on the North Omaha Station Unit Number 3 boiler is the lowest and best bid received on request for proposal number 4160 and is hereby accepted, and the bond or letter of credit of such bidder is hereby approved. Second. Director Weber, please. The purpose of uh, this item is to provide the labor for the removal and replacement of certain sections of water wall tubing in the Unit 3 boiler at North Omaha. Uh, the um, sections of the front and rear water wall arch tubing of the Unit 3 boiler have been evaluated and are recommended for replacement in order to re uh, maintain reliable operation of the unit. The installation of uh, the materials that are supplied by OPPD will occur during a scheduled maintenance outage that will begin on March 1st, 2014. Four bids were received. All of them were technically and legally responsive. The engineer's estimate for this project is $1,300,000, and the action asks for authorization by the board to award a contract to Irwin Industries in the amount of $1,333,000 $330,536. Very good. Questions or comments from board members? Yes, Dr. Gay. Dr. Weber, I think you mentioned this is good, we're spending the money on this, but uh, no matter, these are good long term if we decide to change uh, generation, you need to do it. And then how long, how long do these last? I mean, but, and it's good for whatever we decide to do. These have been in since 1959. So, a long time. Okay. Yeah. Enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so when we switch over, you know, if we, to gas. It's, it's a good investment. Then, long term. Any other comments or questions from board members? <clears throat> from the public? Okay. 
David Corbin, 1002 North 49th Street. As you know, uh, I attend the committee meetings on Tuesdays uh, where the public can attend but not speak. And I'm concerned that the public does not have ample opportunity to weigh in on issues that are discussed in the Tuesday meetings. In this case, you're voting on $1.3 million expenditure on the North Omaha coal plant. It's unlikely that anything anybody on this side says today is going to have any influence whatsoever on your vote. As you know, people have been urging you to shut down the old and dirty North Omaha plant, yet we have had no formal indication of what your intentions are. Uh, we are disheartened that you uh, are voting for more expenditures for the North Omaha plant when the only question that has been asked is the one that was just asked again. Can this equipment be used if we convert to natural gas? The real question is, what is your plan for coal? You have 20-year commitments to wind and to nuclear and even beyond when you're talking about decommissioning, nothing about decommissioning coal. What is your plan for coal? The Union of Concerned Scientists revealed that Nebraska is the fourth highest state in spending per capita for coal. What is your plan to change this? The Omaha World Herald asked a question about the controversy over whether MUD should be privatized. They said, would the short-term benefits of any sale outweigh the long-term costs? I ask you a similar question in light of the financial, environmental, and health costs of coal. What is your long-term plan for coal, and how much money will you keep pouring into that dinosaur plant in North Omaha? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Graham Jordison. Uh, I think David summed up a lot of uh, how I'm feeling about um, uh, this issue. I, I just want to bring up a few points. This is a life extension project. Um, a, a few months ago you were talking, it sounded like to the World Herald, that there would be a 2016 phase out. Now you're putting $1.3 million into preserving the life of this plant. The public doesn't know where you're going with retirement, phase out, natural gas. Uh, I'd like to see a motion today to wait till we get the stakeholders process figured out and give your ratepayers an opportunity to engage in the discussion. Um, we heard months ago that there was going to be a stakeholders process. We thought that that process was going to allow us to um, raise concern on these issues, and it hasn't. It hasn't happened yet. So um, I think the public would really like to, to see you wait and to have an opportunity to engage with you on this. And uh, as we discussed last meeting, a lot of people can't come here uh, Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. So thank you. Thank you. Cynthia Tiedemann, 7562 Drexel Street. And I'm going to kind of echo some of what's already been said, but I'm, I'm really concerned. The union, about a year ago, the Union of Concerned Scientists identified coal plants in the United States that were ripe for retirement, and that included North Omaha Coal Plant. They said that we needed to start making a plan to retire the plant, and they weren't talking about because of public health problems, which which I think there are, or climate issues. They were talking about economic issues. And they said it's not cost effective to run an old coal plant like that. It's not cost effective to run it, let alone upgrade it like a retrofit like we're talking about today. So I don't know if you go to the Tuesday meetings and learn about this and then come here a couple days later and unanimously approve it, or I don't know if you're working with a plan. Do you, um, I would expect that you have a long range plan that you're working on. But again, I've never heard anything about it. As Graham said, um, there is a stakeholders process, but we've never heard anything about what's the long range plan for the North Omaha coal plant. And I also would, would hope that you have the plan, 
And I would also hope that you discuss it with your public before um, making decisions like this. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Patricia Fuller from Council Bluffs. Even though I'm from Council Bluffs and I'm not a rate payer, uh, I still consider myself a stakeholder. Pollution from the North Omaha plant, uh, whether it's air pollution or water pollution, does not stop at the river. We share the same contaminated air and water from the Missouri. Your decisions do impact us in Council Bluffs. Uh, last January, we learned that Mid-American, in order to comply with the Clean Air Act, was closing down or phasing out seven of their oldest boilers, probably comparable in age than to North Omaha. And these units were, two of these units were in Council Bluffs. Mid-American was also required to complete a project to cut emissions from two other coal burning units in Sergeant Bluff. Yesterday, or this week, it was announced that Alliance is uh, converting their coal fire power plant in Clinton, Iowa, to gas generation. That makes the fourth of Alliance coal fire power plants in the Iowa, Minnesota region to either close down or convert. So at least we have a better understanding of what's going on in Iowa, whether these plants are closing down or converting. And I guess what all of us would like to see, rather than a transition to another fossil fuel, is a bigger commitment to either wind or solar. Mid-American did not stop at 400 megawatts of wind. They plan to build as much as 1,050 new megawatts of wind generation, which is adding to their already 2,285 uh, uh, megawatts that they have now. So it's pretty clear that their decisions were based on anticipation of future EPA regulations. Thank you. Anything else? Please call the roll. Barrett. Yes. Gay. Yes. Green. Yes. McGuire. Yes. Mines. Yes. Ulrich. Yes. Weber. Yes. Kavanaugh. Yes. Motion carried. Yes. Item number seven, resolution number 5985. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power District that the proposal of Trans-American Power Products, Inc., in the amount of $423,737 for the pur purchase of transmission tubular steel poles for line 104 is the lowest and best bid received on request for proposal number 4192 and is hereby accepted. So moved. Second. Dr. Weber again, please. The purpose of this item is to uh, purchase steel poles to re relocate approximately one half mile of the transmission line. Uh, these steel poles are required uh, to relocate an existing three, 345 kV transmission line to, from somewhere around the middle to the edge of the customer's property. The proposal includes seven <coughs> transmission structures. We received nine poles. Two of those proposals are legally non-responsive, and one proposal is commercially non-responsive. An evaluation of these proposals was completed, and the Trans-American Power Products Incorporated bid was selected as the lowest and the best evaluated bid. The engineer's uh, estimate for this project is $677,250. This action asks for authorization by the board to award the contract to Trans-American power products in the amount of $423,737 for the purchase of transmission tubular steel pulls for line 104. The reason it's cheaper than the engineer's estimate as we discussed in the committee meetings is uh, uh, advance in technology on uh, how to hang the wires, correct? Exactly. New type of pull. New type of pull. Very Which good. hopefully we'll be using from now on. And uh, assuming that this will be reimbursed by the customer? Yeah, it is going to be, yes. Okay. There will be no cost to you, both the PD. Actually, we want to do the work. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments or questions from board members? Any from the public? Seeing none, please call the roll. Barrett? Yes. Kavanaugh? Mm. Yes. Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Ulrich? 
Yes. Weber. Yes. Motion carried. Uh, time for uh, President Gates to give the State of the Utility Report. President Gates. Thank you, Thank you Chairman Orrick. We'll uh, walk through the district as we normally do, from uh, generation to transmission and uh, finance and customers. With regard to generation, uh, central maintenance, which is our central group that does maintenance at all our power stations, worked essentially at every power <coughs> station over the last month, from Fort Calhoun down to Nebraska City and all the uh, gas turbines in between as well as North Omaha. So a lot of maintenance going on. We'll see that continue through the spring as we prepare for the summer of 2014 uh, with all the units. We did have uh, some significant maintenance done on what's called a bucket wheel reclaimer, which is a big uh, machine that reclaims coal for the use in the facilities. Uh, that was a big maintenance job that was completed uh, since our last meeting, as well as the overhaul of one of the gas turbines at Cass County was completed uh, during December as well. In the renewable energy area, uh, we continue to uh, anticipate the completion of the construction of our second phase of 200 megawatts approximately, and then the uh, new 400 megawatts, which will be following in a year. The numbers for uh, the month were 6.2 percent uh, renewable in the month of December, and the capacity was 46 percent, just, uh, just a shade over 46 percent. We have completed several deployment tests for the Southwest Power Pool, which is our new uh, RTO, which will be jo we have joined and will be implementing this year, and those went quite well. It's, it's the way we dispatch our generation will be on a regional basis now. With regard to Fort Calhoun, the plant is currently at 100 percent power. Uh, as was uh, probably noticed on December 17th, uh, we were notified by the NRC formally that we could start the uh, process of restarting the reactor, which we did. Uh, with uh, making the reactor in critical operations the next day and then proceeding to power. We did shut the unit down uh, last week uh, because of some ice in the intake structure and a very conservative decision. Did some other repairs while we were down and have returned the, the uh, facility to 100 percent power. We did have a graded exercise of our emergency response organization and that went well. We had several visits over the course of time in early January and December, including a visit from the president of the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, uh, retired Admiral Bob Willard, and got good feedback from all the indications. We had the NRC observe operations for the first 10 days when we re resumed operations of the facility, uh, 24 hours a day, and got good feedback uh, on the performance of our operations and maintenance crews and engineering at that time. With regard to transmission distribution, uh, the extremely cold weather in late December, we really stressed in our transmission system with a lot of high power flows, uh, but they had another great uh, performance with, within our transmission distribution system, and the folks that worked that did a great job uh, going forward. It's of note that our substation and system protection department has 75 employees and routine, 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 uh, routinely drives many, many miles over our 13 counties. They've now gone 1,040 days without a pre uh, preventable accident. So good, good job by all those folks. That's a, that's a big deal to be on the roads in, in all kinds of bad weather. We did complete a key milestone in a project on January 8th, and we energized two distribution circuits to serve Fidelity, a new facility that's coming in. And we anticipate that will be up and running by this summer, by midsummer. And we did an assessment of about 800 miles of our high voltage transmission lines to make sure we've got proper clearance, uh, which is a big deal with vegetation clearance. We'll work through some of those uh, this spring as well. We also continue, uh, even at this date, to pursue claims from insurance on the 2011 Missouri flooding within our finance department. And Edward and his team continue to focus on that and we'll see if we can uh, get some more insurance claims paid on that. Uh, just in overall safety of our folks, uh, we completed in 2013 one of our best safety records in de decades. There's a term called DART, which is a way to measure the safety uh, performance. We had 18 DART cases in 2013 compared to 24 in 2012 and 27 in 2011. So congratulations to all the OPPD po folks out there. The men and women did a great job. And as I said before, you know, when we have uh, their storms and many people are gathering by their fireplace or in their basement. Uh, our teams are, are uh, leaving home. Uh, they're getting in their cars and going to work mm -hmm. under adverse conditions and they do it very safely. Uh, obviously that's our goal is to return everybody home in the same condition they came to work mm -hmm. at our company. Uh, we are working hard on the spring on value streaming, uh, which is a way to look at how we do our processes to look for continued efficiencies. With regard to our people, the, the men and women of OPPD that are our foundation, we did have 140 employees attend the OPPD Women's Network kickoff on December 10th. <coughs> Sherry Hetcherson provided the keynote speech there. 
uh, we continue to focus on, on that group providing great input to us going forward. And uh, we did conduct a day of remembrance uh, this week for about 18 people since 1946 that have lost their lives uh, as they uh, pursued the re restoration of electricity or operation of our facilities. And we felt it appropriate to remember them and, and honor them. Many of their family members did attend that. That concludes my report. Is there, thank you, Mr. Gates, is there a uh, plaque or something that to uh, on display for those people, or are we considered that? Yes, there is. Uh, when you leave the auditorium, if you bear left, it's uh, right on that column. Okay, there. yeah. I've probably walked by a hundred uh, times, so, yeah. and just haven't noticed it. Well, good, that's very appropriate. Um, now it's time for our most fun activity, election of board officers. I'm going to go through this a little of the procedure so we're all on the same page because I may have misspoke a little bit on Tuesday. Uh, first of all, it is our normal procedure to uh, uh, have a call roll vote unless there's more than one person nominated, in this, which case we go secret ballot. And any board member at any time can request to go secret ballot if you so desire. The other thing is uh, there is no need to uh, have a motion or second to close nominations. It's just that the chairman's priority when nobody else is nominated, I just close the nominations. And that's the procedure where I intend on following. If everybody's okay, we'll get started. And nominations are now open for chairman yes, of the sir, board. Second no, no, nom no second on nominations either. Okay. I nominate Mike Kavanaugh. Thank you. Dr. Kavanaugh, been nominated. Are there any other nominations? Nominations are closed. Deb, will you please call the roll? Barrett? Yes. Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Ulrich? Yes. Weber? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Motion. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nominations are now open for vice chairman of the board. I nominate Ann McGuire. Very good. Are there any other nominations for vice chairman? Seeing none, nominations are closed. Deb, will you please call the roll? Barrett? Yes. Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Ulrich? Yes. Weber? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Motion carried. Very good. Congratulations. Nominations are now open for treasurer of the board. Go ahead. Oh. I nominate uh, John K. Green for treasurer. Very good. Are there any other nominations for treasurer? Nominations are closed. Could we please call the roll? Barrett? Yes. Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Ulrich? Yes. Weber? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Motion carries. Congratulations, John. And nominations are now open for secretary of the board. I nominate Mick Mines. <coughs> are there any other nominations for secretary of the board? Seeing none, nominations are closed. Deb, will you please call the roll? Barrett? Yes. Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Ulrich? Yes. Weber? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Motion carried. Congratulations to all the new officers. Moving forward. Now, just a second, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Okay. A couple of comments. Uh, I'm ask the new chairman to, to help here. I think it's always appropriate at this time to uh, recognize the uh, chairman that is, uh, has served in, uh, in the past time frame. In this case, it's been a one-year time frame due to some elect the elections that we had last time. So I want to take this opportunity to, to thank Fred Ulrich for all he's done for our company from the, <coughs> representing the management team and all the 2,300 employees we have out there. Uh, his leadership has been extremely valuable. Fred joined the board in 1986. He served in every officer position at least once, and at least twice probably. Uh, as the saying goes, you know, this wasn't his first time time around, so uh, he did a great job. Although it may have been one of the more intense ones uh, over the last year. Uh, you know, when he joined the board, uh, he was appointed by the governor initially and then ran for office. And at that point, uh, it was decided that it would be a good idea to have a nuclear oversight committee. And so the new guy got it. Uh, Fred got it. Now, I've been to Fred with Fred to a lot of meetings with, at the NRC and at bond rating agencies in New York and public meetings here. And he has this, uh, this kind of habit of saying, I'm just Farmer Fred, you know, I'm farming down by Louisville. And, um, uh, and what, what you failed to mention, which I try to call their attention immediately, is he, he came to us uh, returning to Nebraska after working in the Department of Navy on the Trident nuclear power uh, submarine program. 
So uh, we're not going to let you buy with that, <laughs> that comment. Uh, we've been there before. Uh, so uh, neither is Wall Street or neither is the NRC. We know your valuable experience. Uh, you've experienced a lot of things. You've really brought a lot to our utilities. And for me personally, Fred, uh, as we've worked over the years, I want to thank you personally and, and thank you on behalf of the management team. You've done a great job. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to button his coat. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't do it without uh, obviously all these great board members that I work with and the senior management team and all 2,300 employees. The main job of a board of directors I always felt like is to give everybody the possibility to succeed and get out of their way. And uh, the, this is a team that really uh, thrives on that and uh, I really appreciate all their efforts to do it. And uh, I'm quite uh, humbled by your comments. I appreciate it very much. Now that all that fun's over with, Opportunity for comment on other items of district business. John Pollock, 1412 North 35th Street. Well, the, uh, the past month, of course, we had a pretty extreme cold outbreak. Uh, one of the things that's interesting to me, this isn't the first time we've seen this pattern, although it is a rare pattern. Uh, what it does is uh, uh, bring uh, cold air out of Canada very rapidly before it has a chance to warm up much on the way down. Uh, this one was not as cold as uh, historical ones that have produced the, uh, the same kind of pattern because the air in Canada isn't as cold as it used to be, basically. Uh, of course, it did bring the term polar vortex into the uh, news media. They needed uh, something to hang on to it. It's not new. It's been around forever as far as we know. And uh, this was just an example. Last month, uh, that vortex, that circulation, was uh, displaced toward uh, the uh, North American Atlantic Center. Uh, now it's uh, recentered itself a little bit so that it, it's more over the North Pole on the average, which means that Asia is getting more cold weather and we're getting a little less. However, we still have uh, a big ridge off the West Coast and a big uh, trough, which is prone to become a large circulation in the middle of the country. The consequence is that we're going to continue to see these storms that we've been having. For our district, it means 
a lot of wind, uh, more wind challenges coming up every few days, a succession of uh, cold blasts with uh, warmer air in between. Uh, within the next few weeks, I don't see anything coming that looks quite like December, but uh, the other noteworthy thing is that this is a very dry pattern for us. Uh, most of the snow is well to our north. Uh, the uh, ridge on the west coast is not letting any rain in from the Pacific, so it's a case of more low flow. If we get enough cold weather, it's, uh, of course, more icing in the river. Uh, and if this persists, going into spring, uh, they're going to have trouble letting uh, as much water as usual down the Missouri River. They're going to have to be holding quite a bit back because we're not getting it in the northern Rockies the way we usually do with the upper Missouri Basin in general. There is some moisture. We started out in the fall doing pretty well, but uh, we're not adding on to it the way we should be. Uh, so that's the, uh, the overall big picture is that uh, the pattern has shifted eastward a little bit so that the, uh, the worst of the cold weather for a while is going to be uh, hitting the Great Lakes and points east of us. Uh, however, the uh, basic pattern really hasn't changed greatly from what we were seeing a month ago. It's kind of stuck. Thanks, John. Thank you. I always look forward to your monthly updates. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, um, Crystal Craig from La Vista. I'm um, <clears throat> so. What, from what I understand, you're spending about another half a million dollars on the North Omaha coal plant. <clears throat> Recently, you had to make some repairs and shut down the Fort Calhoun plant right after you had it started. Um, could you please somebody go into some detail on exactly what those other repairs were um, and what the costs are for those repairs? And can you tell me if the rate payers are going to see an increase in their, on their bills because of any of these things that are... I can answer that part, no. Uh, the short answer on the repairs of Fort Calhoun was uh, very minimal. It's it's uh, basically a, a gate that opens, lets water in from the Missouri River. It's just a rod that got bent. It'll be fixed directly, and, and uh, it's not any big nuclear project, so to speak. That, you know, because I agree. Anytime you talk nuclear repairs, you, you cringe. But this is just a mechanical thing. Uh, anything else you want to add? Uh, it was. Uh the other maintenance was uh, stuff we always keep that if we do have a unit shut down, we go ahead and do that maintenance. Not required online, but we do it if we have the opportunity, uh, which we did on some of those items, and they were all fairly straightforward, normal maintenance, but not large cost items, and definitely won't affect the rates. And uh, same with North Omaha, or Nebraska City, any stations we have down there now. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Howdy. Matt Cronin, 4515 Charles Street. I'm glad to hear the plants are going to make it. I'm, uh, I'm a little concerned of the public power system, and I really, my family, we never grew up with a lot of money. We used to have an old jalopy, an old beater car, and uh, you put more and more money into it, and it got you where you needed to be, but at what cost, right? We kept putting more and more money into it, and you... We don't see an increase in efficiency. It was made for a time when my father was a young man. He probably had it since that age. And it has fundamental limits to what it can do and with where we want to go. And so once my family realized after a certain amount of time that this is not the means that we should be moving, that this is actually getting us, putting us back when we thought that this, you know, holding on to this, this piece of infrastructure that we had that this was the right thing to do. And it makes sense at the time, right? Short-term payments, you can mediate the strain or help, you know, not make that big purchase like it would otherwise seem, you know, un unaccessible, you know, especially for if you don't have that disposable income. You know, we have, we have the public power system. This is very, very special. And the whole MUD, you know, trying to sell our privatized municipal services, 
Um, I feel if we continue on this route, if we continue doing these short-term investments in these systems that aren't investing in the resilience of this state, that don't empower the people to really care where their power comes from, you know, that doesn't, when we continue to disconnect where we, we get our energy, you know, yes, any kids, I teach a lot of kids and they all, you know, ask them where their power comes, they say the light switch, you know, what if you could just say, yeah, that power came from the sun, you know, the fossil fuels, they, they also come from the sun, just a much more expensive process of the long term. So what I want to leave with is, if we can really start to add up these costs, add up all these these continual investments and you know these transitions to new power plants or new updated facilities what does it look like when we really add into the cost of distribution you know we you you all are all obliged to pursue the most cost effective means of producing power but what about distribution you talk about the loads that we've been having during these cold snaps well if we had other ways to mediate that strain on the grid well if we had investments that actually valued the citizens health and valued our my future, the future of my kids when I have them. So I just want to leave you with that. Please consider something else because the way things are going, we're, we're driving this old jalopy into the ground and by the time it breaks down officially, we're going to have to sell it off and then, like you said, we're going to be left with a bigger cost in the end. So, thank you. Good morning. John Adkiss of Nebraska Wildlife Federation representing our members uh, in OPB territory and the rest of the state. Um, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but I don't think everybody's entitled to their own set of facts. And one of the difficulties and issues that are made controversial is where do you go for your facts and who do you believe? In general, I think it's a a pretty good idea to go to the people who are experts, who do the work all day every day, who are rep who are recognized in their field uh, for doing excellent work. Um, if I want to know how to run a coal plant, I know there's people here uh, who are the experts and who know what they're doing on running a coal-fired power plant. No question about that. In matters of climate and the effects of CO2, I think the same principle applies. You can either make your life's work, as they do in large part, um, reading the scientific papers about the understanding of climate and its components and their pretty complex interactions, or you can go to the experts, the climate scientists, in ways that they make it more understandable for us. Websites like uh, blogs, like realclimate.org and skepticalscience.com, uh, run by climate scientists to, to get actual information and, and science-based facts out. Since there's been some uh, assertions made, I just I'll just pick on a couple of them. Uh, the, from information that I get from reading the papers and from, from going to the more popularly written sites. Uh, sure, there's been other times when CO2 has been at a different concentration that has a particular cause and a particular effect. And of course, the cause for the increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now is human activity of various kinds in the negative sense, deforestation in the positive sense, uh, primarily industrial activity, including, and of course in the United States, the most important single factor, the burning of coal. You can see in some of the uh, studies of the effects of increased CO2 in plants that there is some boost in apparent immediate productivity. But for instance, in a crop that's of some interest to us, uh, soybeans, Everything looks good until you realize that their immune system seems to be compromised by the, the CO2. So superficially, it all looks pretty good, but you start really beating on the problem and, and examining it closely, and it's really not that simple. A paper that, uh, and a, a thread of research that has recently gotten my attention came out of the University of Hawaii where they defined climate departure. That is, when are we really different? We talk about climate change and 
going to new climates and what the heck does that mean? They define it as when the uh, climate parameters like temperature get beyond the bounds of experience for the past um, 140 or so years. When you look at it at, in that way, it appears that a little detail has been overlooked, that entering a new climate regime is happening much more quickly when defined that way. In the tropics, it will happen at the end of this decade, and we will get there, here, by mid-century. And all you farmers on the, on the board know that you don't have to have real high temperatures all the time to have an effect on agriculture. You have that, that change at just the wrong time and it, it messes up the whole season. So I just wanted to, to bring those things uh, to your attention and we'll be following up with you on it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Director Gay, you said you wanted to make a comment. Yeah. Uh, I was just a little slow in the switch when we were doing the president's comments, but I wanted to bring up on, um, on the finance committee that for everything this day forward trading. That's, is that in March that's going to happen? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Spring. Yeah. The reason I bring that up, I, I just think that would be a good topic that maybe everyone should, maybe we could tell the public what's going on. I think it's a game changer, isn't it? Oh, the way we're going to market. So I'd like to have maybe a presentation at the next board meeting for the public as well to say here's what's going on with this day forward trading I, I hope it goes off you know not that word, without, a, without a hitch but um, from what I've been hearing about it is it's pretty it's challenging it's a challenge you got yeah. but, but I, if we could get that on the agenda maybe next next meeting business aspect thank you Sounds good. And as entertaining as this all may have been, I might note that Samantha has barely looked up from her iPhone. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. And I get to use this. This meeting's adjourned. <laughs>